My name is Jeffrey Nicholas. I am an associate professor of philosophy at Providence College in Rhode Island. This is a lecture on David Schweikert's After Capitalism, Chapter 2. This will be part one of the lecture, and there will be a following part two lecture on Chapter 2 uh, following this one. If you have not seen it, my first lecture uh, is on Chapter 1 of Justifying Capitalism, and you probably want to view that one uh, before viewing this one. So as an overview over these two lectures, we're going to talk about uh, Schweikert's opening question. Then we're going to look at what an economic structure is, define capitalism, and look at the argument for marginal, marginal product as a defense of capitalism. That will be part one. Part two, then, will begin with discussing the entrepreneur, uh, risk and reward, utility deferred, and then there is no alternative, and we'll end with uh, some questions that we, we might want to ask uh, the author. So if you have not uh, had any introduction to a political economy or to the labor theory of value, you may want to watch a different video before watching this one. Uh, this one will presume that you are familiar with the basic ideas of the labor theory of value developed by John Locke and Adam Smith and those uh, political economists that uh, really began the defense of uh, capitalism. Uh, and that you can either link to uh, with this uh, URL right here on YouTube. It is a 15-minute video uh, that looks at uh, the basics of the labor theory of value. Now, the question that Schweikert begins with is this. How can it be right that under capitalism, some people have so much while others have so little? In other words, what do capitalists do in order to merit the wealth that they have? And we can just look out into the world and see not only that there are uh, vast uh, inequalities between different groups of people, but the way that this inequality can play out and harm some people uh, while seemingly benefiting others. And the fact that uh, capitalists can have billions of dollars while other people are scraping by uh, day to day, uh, if that even, or who are homeless and without food, uh, what is it that capitalists do that merits such wealth uh, in the face of uh, this poverty? When we ask this kind of question, one thing that we're asking about is the economic structure of a society. And here, when we talk about the economic structure, we're talking about both laws and customs that govern the relationships between human labor, so the work that people do, the means of production, so the, the tools and things that we need in order to produce the goods that satisfy our needs, and the products that result from uh, the mixture of labor and the means of production. Uh, so we might talk about working a 40-hour week uh, in a factory uh, that produces pumpkin pie, and uh, that factory includes uh, various machines, uh, heat, cooking machines, mixing machines, etc. Those are the means of production, and the product that comes out is, of course, the tasty pumpkin pie. Uh, and if you want whipped cream with that, you'll have to have a different factory with different human labor and different means of production. So the economic structure is the laws and customs that govern those relationships. How is it that labor and the means of production and the products are related in the ways that they are in this particular society? So capitalism is a particular economic function and Schweikert identifies four features of capitalism. He defines capitalism with these uh, features. Uh, really, it's three features with some clarifications. I apologize about that. The first one is that the bulk of the means of production are privately owned, either directly or by corporations that are themselves owned by private individuals. So when we talk about the means of production, the factories, the land, the tools that are needed to produce the goods that uh, we produce in order to satisfy the needs that we have, uh, those are owned either directly by private individuals 
or by corporations that are themselves owned by private individuals. So the Coca-Cola factory is owned by a corporation and it has uh, a variety of machines that, is the, that are the means of production and we cannot make Coca-Cola without uh, access to those means of production. Here we want to carefully distinguish between private property and personal property. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this concept of the private ownership of the means of pro production is called private property. That's unfortunate because often when we would use the term private property, we think that we're talking about the things that I individually own, uh, such as my phone or my house or my car. But that is personal property. Uh, under a Marxian understanding. So when Marx says we're going to get rid of private property, he's not talking about getting rid of my personal property like my phone or my, my uh, iPad. He's talking about getting rid of the private ownership of the means of production. A second feature of capitalism is that most products are exchanged in a market. And the idea here is that prices are determined by competition and not uh, primarily by some government pricing authority. Now, uh, we know that, in course, in every market, the government has some control over pricing, whether that's through sub subsidies or some other feature. Uh, and it has always been the case that government has had some control over pricing, even if that is just limiting the uh, boundaries through which these uh, products are exchanged. Uh, so products are exchanged in this kind of market where the price is primarily determined by competition and not by a government authority. And then the third feature is that most people who, uh, who work uh, are people who work for pay for other people, and those other people own the means of production. So we have the wage laborers uh, who work for the capitalists or the corporations, and these ways uh, the most people are wage laborers. Laborers. So those are the three defining features of capitalism. Now it's important to recognize that these are uh, the, defining an economic and not a political system, uh, and that all three of these, according to Schweikert, must be present for the system to be understood as a capitalist system, and that's going to be important for uh, his discussion of the successor system, which I talked about in Lecture 1, and which we will talk about in future uh, lectures. And then finally, uh, that the market economy does not equal capitalism. So uh, the market might exist in a variety of different situations. Uh, Schweikert talks about how the market exists in China and did exist in Russia, even though he does not define those as capitalism. Uh, but we can see that, of course, there were markets in other uh, societies before capitalism, and presumably there will be markets after capitalism. So... Those are some clarifications, but the defining features are the uh, private ownership of the means of production, uh, the market that uh, determines uh, prices by competition, and that most people are wage laborers. In this situation, then, a capitalist is someone who owns enough productive assets that if he or she chooses, he or she can live comfortably on income generated by these assets. So we're talking about someone who... Uh, owns enough that produces money or produces goods that produce money that he, uh, he or she does not, in fact, have to work for uh, his or her money. Uh, if you read some of Jane Austen's novels, uh, like Pride and Prejudice, she talks about the income generated from owning such and such amount of land, and that becomes important for the story of her uh, in her novel and for the characters. And of course, that's true uh, for us as well, that uh, some people do not have to work, and in fact, some people choose not to work. And uh, when we're making that distinction between wage laborers and capitalists, we really want to keep in mind that even if the capitalist does work in some sense, the capitalist is not working primarily for a wage labor. Now, what justifies uh, capitalism? One of the earliest answers is that it is the marginal product that capitalism produces which justifies the accumulation of capital. So when we talk about production, producing the pumpkin pie, for instance, we have the land, the labor, and the capital. So the land, of course, is where we grow the pumpkins. The labor is where we uh, work to harvest the pumpkins and turn them into pie. And then the capital, 
Well, that raises the question, what is, in fact, capital? So capital here is not necessarily money, but the, the whatever it is that allows land and labor to come together in certain ways. So neoclassical economics uh, tries to provide a response to Marxist challenge uh, that the distribution of wealth is unfair, and it does so by saying that this distribution is just uh, by arguing for this marginal product. And the idea is that uh, if we increase the number of people working, we will uh, increase the output of the product up into a certain point. And once we reach that point, then the, uh, the, the increase between the second last person and the last person added that increases the product is the marginal product. And people are uh, presumably awarded to that marginal product. We can do the same with land. And Schweikert goes into some mathematics to explain uh, how this comes out to uh, be a perfect system. Uh, but in fact, it's abstracted. And nowhere do we see the case that we can take the marginal product of labor and the marginal product of land to come up with what is actually produced. So this means that the marginal product is actually an arbitrary definition. Uh, in attempting to define what is uh, justifying the wage, we simply pick a certain point and say this is what justifies the wage. Um, but of course, defining that is deceptive because uh, contribution entails entitlement. And if people are working at certain rates uh, and they own all of the property, then they have they split all of the wealth. And so it's not really uh, determined by the marginal product. And so he gives this counter argument of Tim laborers uh, cultivating land as a collective. They would receive the entire product and the capitalist would not receive anything because there's no capitalist involved. There's no private ownership of the means of production. And this becomes important as he uh, continues his argument uh, for uh, his counter uh, system. Uh, but the marginal product faces further problems. First, uh, it's an attempt to answer a quantitative problem, but this quantitative problem, problem only exists because there is a qualitative problem. What is that qualitative problem? problem? How do we specify the landowner's contribution? What is the quality of that contribution? How do we understand what capital is? And if we think about this, the landowner's contribution, the person that owns the land on which we're growing the, the pumpkin, remains the same at the end of the process. So the laborer works in the field, raises the pumpkins, harvests the pumpkins, turns the pumpkins into pie, and is paid a wage. And at the end of it, uh, all of that disappears. The labor and the wage and the pumpkin pies disappear, whereas the land remains and the landowner continues to own that land. So this is a qualitative problem. What is the landowner actually contributing uh, simply by owning the land? People who uh, have free land can just go out and farm that land without giving anything to someone else. And so here uh, is another problem, is that there's a paradox in neoclassical economics because it makes the landowner or the capitalist a passive person in the process. And so it seems like even more so, the capitalist adds nothing to uh, the uh, product in order to produce a profit. So this leads us to our questions. Why do we need landlords? Why do we need capitalists? And Schweikert will come back to these questions over and over again as he argues for his successor theory. And so if you think about those um, three aspects of capitalism that I discussed earlier on, uh, one of them is the private ownership of uh, the means of production. And primarily what uh, Schweikert is arguing against is that we need such private ownership. That is the end of this uh, part of the lecture. So this is part one of the lecture, and we went over his economic uh, opening question, his economic structure, defining capitalism, and the argument for marginal product. In chapter two, lecture part two, uh, we are looking at the uh, entrepreneur, the risk and reward, the utility deferred, the, the, the idea that there's no alternative, and we'll ask some questions uh, about this situation.